Guillermo Pereira, Security Analyst, Gerardo Rack. Prada, Systems Development en LACNIC, Jorge Cano, software, Senior Software Engineer. For this session, we have the following presentations. The Security Module and the LACNIC by Guillermo. The impact on transfers and the lactic system by Fernanda and novelty news in the LACNIC website. So let us start with Guillermo's presentation. Good afternoon. I'm going to show the uh, uh, how you can access uh, here in Milaknik. But first of all, let me tell you about uh, Laknik's uh, incident uh, response team. Our main uh, objective is to coordinate. We have a, an active role. Uh, to, we can't go and uh, solve uh, security incidents, but we try. When an institution cannot contact another, they have a problem and they need brokerage among the parties. We try to play that role as coordinators. We don't have the authority for the uh, uh, members' uh, uh, networks, for some it is well known, but we receive cases. Uh, People think that LACNIC has the authority to uh, do something about phishing or when one organization is attacking the other, but our role is actually to coordinate among the parties. We have several services, most of which are proactive. We have uh, training services. There are some courses in the LACNIC uh, uh, campus creation of uh, response teams. We have a uh, uh, implemented several projects to try to improve the security of the internet in the region. You can visit our website. You can report incidents. Clicking on that button, you can see our projects, such as the sensors network that we have. I'll tell you about it. We have some security articles, and we have some of our own statistics and some of third parties with good, with reliable statistics. Now, let me tell you about the projects that feed the security module, including the network of sensors. If you want to know it more in detail, on Friday at 10, Graciela and I will uh, give a talk at LACNOC about this. This is a network that we have display, deployed among the members. If you want to participate, the idea is to collaborate. We install the sensors, the servers that m m pretend being vulnerable so that uh, the attackers may enter with some malicious attempts and we check their activities. We bring some uh, um, uh, compromise uh, indicators uh, and we want each of the organizations to know that that IP was involved in a suspicious activity. Probably it may be infected with a malware or be under the control of an attacker. So let, I'm going to show you how you would see it. We have projects that are more uh, um, and that are more limited. There are others that last more. The open resolvers are DNSs that accept uh, queries from any uh, host of the internet, and they solve that uh, query, amplifying the response when the network allows for spoofing. An attacker may be, change the IP of origin, and when this DNS that is um, um, instead of the attacker, um, it's the victim that receives. There are thousands of these DNS, DNSs exposed to the internet. There are DNSs that must be there, but most of them should not. 
It's because they've been, they've not been configured well. We raise the DNS, and they are not, um, and and they remain exposed. So we try to find these open resolvers of IPv6, and we also receive data of organizations that we know and that we trust, uh, such as the national uh, networks. They send us IPs that were sending spam, or they were in some, uh, um, and so if there are any compromised uh, um, IPs, we report them, and we also receive phishing, and the same. We bring the IPs and the URLs of that were involved in phishing, and then the related problems. Uh, DDoS attacks, it is very common to put them in blacklists. Sometimes we receive reports requesting assistance because they've fallen in a blacklist. We try to guide them. And these reports that reach Milaknik, it's, it's good to use them because certainly that range that we are being requested for will request the assistance of uh, Milagnik because they fell in one of the uh, um, hands of an organization. Then we have sending spam post and then uh, phishing and malware. So this is how they access. Several of you have access to Milaknik in itself to access the module. It's the column at your left, and the reports, you deploy the menus, and you go to the one that says security in there. Before this screen, you will see a guideline telling you what each, the instructions explaining each box. So what you'll see is, well, the pies are green, but it shows the slash uh, 44, 48 that are affected, and here you see different reports. The date it was detected, the organization, in case there are, there's more than one organization, the IP of that organization, the type of attack, if it's phishing, if it's malware, if it fell in the sensors network, ports, if it's a phishing, we give you the URL so that they can check that everything is okay, or it may be an active phishing, and more information is sent to the website with further data. So we have some future steps that we want to do to improve this. It would be improving the sensor network that is deployed, more related with the LACNIC HoneyNet. We collect uh, hardware, we don't do much intelligence, but it would be good to take it to a sandbox and see how the malware behaves. Maybe we can try and detect more defect, more attacked IPs. We try to put more sensors in the honey net. By next year, we will integrate more protocols like this one that we send of open resolvers, integrate more types of protocol, routing protocols, etc. This is something that we plan for next year. And the option, not all users can have access. Maybe um, not all users can access, but there's a new option that through which the administrators will be able to delegate to the technical um, people that can have access to this module. Now I'll leave the email and you can ask me at the end if you can't access. Create notifications somehow to alert you that in that module there is something. So far we don't have any alerts, but well, I don't know whether we have time for questions. And if not, you can send me an email. Thank you.
Yes. I invite you to come closer to the microphones, maybe via Zoom. Guille, you mentioned that all associate uh, organizations have access to this module. Yes, all of them, uh, except Brazil, has access to this module. Mexico does. Thank you, Guille. Now, let me give the floor to Jorge Cano. Hello, can you hear me? So, in a few seconds, I'll be sharing my screen. So, my name is Jorge Cano. I'm part of the LACNE group, and this is a small presentation on what we've been doing in LACNE for a couple of years with respect to the RPKI protocol. As you've seen throughout this event, or maybe you knew it before, the RPKI protocol helps uh, uh, tell apart the f fake and the true announcements so the administrators that have internet resources assigned may create ROAS that are objects that indicate from which ASNs those resources were announced. While the RPKI validators help the routers download this information, analyze it, and be able to distinguish fake and false announcements. The fake announcements might be misconfiguration by someone, or maybe a hacker is trying to do something with those blocks. So part of what we've uh, done is we have developed a new version of our RPKI implementation, trying to make it more resilient, more efficient, easier to maintain and to update, and it's built on Krill. You know that Krill is one of the best tools available in the market, very efficient, it runs very smoothly, and that is why we chose it to include it in our systems to provide a better service. It is worth noting that these services are rather for the people in Brazil that are not in Brazil, because the members in Brazil can enter with the VR registry, but uh, the rest will work with this new version. This new version will be completed in late October this year. Now, if you have a ROAS created uh, already, you'll have to do something to uh, the question is, would, do we have to do anything to start operating with the system? No, because the system will be absolutely transparent. You don't have to do anything as users. Uh, if you have a row as created, they can be transferred with a new system. If you don't have any rows created, then we can you can create them now or later. No problem. All right. So let's see the fourth validator. That's the other um, aspect. So initially, we saw how we form uh, the information that is consumed by the RPKI. Now we're going to talk of the validators. This is the forward validators that we have uh, designed with Mexico. It is uh, open source and uh, it can be used free of charge. Anybody can download it. You don't have to pay anything either for beta testing or for usage, it's absolutely free. And what we have been doing this year for Ford is that we have an important update for early November this year. That's the version 1.60. This is a version that in a new re-implementation of the RD, RRDP protocol. We implemented this protocol in the previous session. Ford was too new at the time, and we didn't know it so well. Now that we have more experience, 
we decided to re-implement it more efficiently so that we could grow faster and to do it more continuously and more simply. We also improved uh, the uh, way the local cache is managed. We put everything in a local cache so that people can consult it uh, locally without having to go to the internet for each request. So we implemented local improvements for the management of local cache. And of course, too, we correct several bugs and small internal improvements that we find in the code. So as I told you, this is the new version 1.6 that we try will try to have ready by early November. If you want to know more information about the Ford project or the validator specifically here, I can leave you a couple of links. You can consult all the information there. The information is available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. It's easy to read and to, uh, and you can also contact us directly if you have any doubts. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Once again, let me remind you that if you wish to ask any questions, you can go up to the microphones that we have in the aisles. So we now go on. I'd like to give the floor to Gerardo with his presentation on the impact of resource transfers in the in operations. Very often IPs are transferred, they are used in production. So some of these IPs are linked to mail servers. So they are configured in LACNIC with the reverses in order to be able to send that email and to categorize, or to categorize it as spam so that it doesn't appear on their blacklist. Some of these IPs are also used to assign them to customers. So these are sub-assignments in LACNIC's registry in order to reflect which is the organization that is entitled to use that IP. Sometimes IPs are used to connect to the internet. So the providers need that IP to be available for routing. So we have to generate the ROA, and that IP has an associated ROA or has a route says IPs that are transferred are used to create AS sets to indicate the upstream that there is a set of clients that they need to provide transit to their customers. So we are asked to create an AS set to enable that situation. Sometimes the IPs involved in transfers are connected or associated to customers and then the applications, the providers they have that have connected with API or with the other forms. When new customers come up, they use these connections to sub-assign these resources to these customers. So ultimately, what I want to show with this slide is that a large part of the operations of providers and LACNIX members depends on one of these systems that we have over here. When transfers take place, and depending on the type of operation at LACNIC, this might have a greater or lesser impact on the services that I have just shown you. We have three types of operations to, produce, to make transfers. The first operation is when we decide to change the name of the organization. This way of doing the transfer is what has the least impact because ultimately we go to the organization that we have registered. We, this is org three and we rename it to org four and the rest of the information that we generated in the systems continues working as it is. This is because the identifier of the organization hasn't changed. So any other information generated from that identifier remains consistent. The other way of doing transfers is going to the resource as such and changing the identifier of the company. When we do operations like those, 
the resource ID is maintained. So the entire configuration that was generated based on that resource remains the same. The same. It remains there. The third way of doing transfers is eliminating the resource and assigning it once again. When we do operations like those, this is the ones that has a greater impact on the information that is generated in the different systems. Now, this is because you eliminate resources, you eliminate the reference to that identifier, so all the information built from then onwards from then is eliminated, and we create a new record, which is we start from scratch. And the fourth way are similar to the third case. But basically, what I wanted to show here is that there are two organizations involved. Elimination is done on one system, and the registration is done in a different system. For example, when you, this is another RIR, or when one of the NIRs, the NIRs, participates. So basically here, this is what I have described. There are three or four different ways of doing transfers and the different levels of impact these have. Now, depending on the reason for doing this transfer, we might use these different options. When we are requested to change names, this is one of the transfer types that we can do. Then we use option number one, which is changing names. So this is the one that is most compatible with all the other systems and has the least impact on operations. When we do transfers type mergers or acquisitions, there is some kind of legal status involved, then we can do the trick of replacing or changing the organization of that resource. So this maintains the information in some of the systems, and in other systems, you have to rebuild this information. Now, when this link cannot be demonstrated or when IPs are sold or when there is another transfer resources which is not merger acquisition, in those cases, in the majority of cases, we have to remove that resource and assign it once again. So in this way, the impact on the systems is greater. And finally, when we involve another IIR or an NIR, the transfer occurs, for example, between LACNIC region and Brazil or Mexico, which are others in the region, the same thing happens as with the previous case, but this might take longer because the operation takes place on two different locations, although we try to coordinate things in order to make this happen in the shortest time possible. So it's similar as a third case, but which takes a bit longer. And also, depending on the type of resources that are transferred, we have to remove this or not. When it is a total transfer, when you transfer the entire block, for example, LACNIC assigned two slash 16 blocks, you can change the organization. But if the transfer is a partial transfer, for example, you assigned a slash 26, but you're going to transfer a slash 20, you have to remove that block and assign the new block. So depending on the reason for the transfer and depending on what you are transferring, the type of operation we do at LACNIC can vary. What we have over here is what I have been saying just now. When we edit the name, the who is information is maintained. And this is immediate. The same happens with the RDAP and MILACNIC immediately reflects information of that transfer. And all the sub-assignment scheme that we had is then maintained. The reverse we had configured are maintained. If we you do DNSSEC for the reverse, this is maintained. And the same with RPKI, with the route objects. And with the API connection, all that information remains and it remains operational right after that transfer. Now, when we edit the organization, then all the information created in RPKI has to be rebuilt. And the same happens with the route objects and route six in the IRR. If the transfer informs an autonomous system, you have, system, you have to rebuild the AS set in the IRR. The API and SARA connections, because this is new, then they have to be 
these systems have to be connected to the new organization that has the resources and all the tools and services resulting from these services will then take some time in to have access to the information until it is totally reconstructed. Now, when we edit the organization of this resource, we maintain the information on the reverses and also of the sub-assignments, the WHOIS and the RDAP information is preserved and updated. And finally, the option of eliminating and creating the resource once again, in addition to what happened in the previous case, that you change the IRR and RPKI information, this also eliminates information of the reverse DNSs and the DNSSEC information and the sub-assignment information. So that information is lost and it has to be rebuilt. And the information on who is RDAP and the Milaknik remains in force once the transfer is completed. Now, what options do we have to solve this? We have the Milaknik interface and you can and this is a more user-friendly option, depending on the amount of resources that is then transferred. But this is one of the options that we have. The next option is to do this automatically. So we have the API, and we have the older version of the API, which is SARA. And basically, this is the most secure option, the most powerful one in terms of the possibility the operator has to rebuild the information. And it also shows that the operator can generate a software that allows them to connect to the API and also to do this stage by stage and to know what things failed and retry. So, this implies work on the side of the operator, which is no minor task. So although this is the best option, this implies planning when conducting this transfer so that the transfer is as least as possible or to solve this over a shorter period of time. And for the future, in the case of RPKI, this is already in, uh, valid. We're studying massive operations in Milaknik. So what we intend to do is allow operators to make massive operations as is allowed by the API, but without the need to develop software. So the concept we tried with RPKI is as follows, to allow to download the current status of the rowers in this case, and to allow to upload that new status, the file you just downloaded, you modified, and you uploaded. So the RPKI reflects the status of the file that you are uploading. So you do the modification and you do a creation, elimination, or whatever, uh, whatever is necessary so that this reflects the status of the file that you are uploading now. So we think that with this option, somehow we're going to facilitate the work when doing transfers or at least to shorten the response times. So this is information I had to share with you. If you have any questions, I'll, we, I'll be around. So a big round of applause for Gerardo. Thank you very much. Any questions? No questions in the Zoom or in the room? So now, let me tell you about some of the changes we made in LACNIX web in the R&D section. So the objective was to centralize the different information sources, sources and to unify access to the different portals and tools where you can find all the information regarding research and development. This is the current view of the R&D area with five subsections. Some have no changes, for example, the link to the technical reports or the one on IPs or ASN for research and the link to LACNIC blog. Let me just comment that this year LACNIC news became LACNIC blog. This implies generating weekly contents by LACNIC staff and external sources and LACNIC blog's content is also LACNIC Labs, Secret Access Health can be found in LACNIC blog. 
And then we added two sections that are new. One is internet measurements, where you can find all the measurements and statistics we generate at LACNIC together with collaborators, and the measurement tools, where you can see the tools that allow you to measure things or to see what things are being measured. So this was all, and hopefully you can make the most of it, and you have any comments or suggestions, you can always write to comunicaciones at LACNIC. Dot net. So that was all. Thank you. So now, if there are no further questions, I now finish technology hour. Thank you very much. I apologize, we have a question in the Zoom. Eli, I have a question. And this is a question for Gerardo. In the past, we could do a query of the signed rowers. Currently, at Milaknik, I cannot view this. What is this due to? Hello. Well, currently, you can visualize the rowers in Milaknik. The form of presentation has changed. And this, what we presented today, is different. This is the RPBF, the different combinations of prefixes, maximum length, and ASN. This was presented group by autonomous systems, and that is the visualization we have now. We don't have the visualization of the rowers like we had in the past, but they have been grouped in this way. Thank you, Gerardo. Thank you, Carlos. So now, yes, thank you very much. We now close technology our time. <laughs>